Okay, welcome to lecture four of computer architectures on digital logic. Just before we start, I want to zoom out and take a bit of an overview of the module so far. Where have we come from? Where are we going? This module has three large structures. We're looking at the fundamentals of architecture. These are the basic ingredients that we use to build computers. So, so far we've thought about what is a computer, we've looked at how people have made computers throughout history, how that's taken us to the technologies we have now. Last week we were looking at data representation. This is specifying the kinds of things we want computers to do. We want them to manipulate numbers and text. This week we're going to look at how we implement both the storage of that data representation and the operations on that data using effectively electronic components uh, via logic gates. When we've done that, we're going to move to the second chunk of the module, which is putting this stuff together into larger structures. We're going to see how we actually build a, a processor, a CPU, by putting all these small machines into one place. Then we're going to look at making CPUs more complex, using more modern techniques. Then we're going to go off the CPU into the rest of the computer. We're going to look at the computer's memory. We're going to look at input-output, which is its interface to the real world. Um, and then after that, we're going to look at some applications of this stuff. We're going to look at different kinds of architectures, embedded architectures that go out into the real world, um, parallel architectures for big data processing, we're going to look at performance and some real world um, or maybe more futuristic real world architectures at the end. So today's topic is digital logic. So this means the use of mathematical logic called Boolean logic. It means the use of logic gates which are typically electronic devices that implement that kind of logic. And we're going to use those to construct these basic building blocks. So we're going to see both how to construct a logic gate out of transistors and also how to make what are called simple machines from logic gates. And those simple machines are going to show up as the components of CPUs and computer memory and all, all over other chips later in the module. So. This process has two main aspects. One is called com combinatorial logic. Um, these are circuits where the notion of time is not so important, where you're just computing a function by putting a bunch of logic gates together. Um, more complex is the notion of sequential logic. This is if you feed a logic gate output back into its input to make a feedback loop. Uh, then you have to start working with time and sequences. And this is how we build computer memory in particular. OK? So we're going to look at maths, electronics, and then building things, sequential and temporal things. So Boolean logic was created by this guy, George Boole. Um, George Boole is a Lincoln hero. A lot of this work was, was done here. Um, Boole would have been thinking about this stuff as he walked along the same streets that you guys are walking on um, when, when you come here every morning. Um, George Boole is one of the great geniuses of our field. Um, he was an autodidact. He, he, he was self-taught, um, which was very unusual for an academic at the time. Um, almost everyone else we've seen in the, the history of computing was rich, and they were very expensively educated, and they got into Cambridge and so on. Um, Boole was the son of a shoemaker from Lincoln, and he taught himself by going to the library, as you guys can do, and reading a lot of books and finding his own way through these materials. It was because of that he was able to do some very creative and kind of weird things that no one else was thinking about. There's, there can be an advantage to working in this way. If you're not part of the academic system, you don't have to follow the, the trends and conform with what everyone else was doing. So he was able to do some really genius work here in Lincoln, which at the time was far away from the, the academic senses of, of excellence and the, the famous places. So he was a member of something called the Lincoln Topographical Society. Um, he also worked at the Mechanics Institute here. 
And to, to pay for all of this, he set up a school on Pottergate. This is round, round the side of the cathedral up the hill. If you're ever walking around up there, see if you can find any evidence of him. Um, I think there's a plaque showing where he used to live and work. So he set up a school to teach in his own way, um, and that, that funded him to do mathematics and computer science and to, to come up with his own theory of logic. There's a window in the cathedral here commemorating him as well. So what exactly did Boole do that was so revolutionary? Well, for around 2,000 years until Boole, the study of logic had not really changed at all from Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle was a Greek, and he began this process of trying to formalize what logical reasoning is using words and philosophical arguments. If you want to make an argument for the existence of God, you're going to take some premises. For example, you might consider everything that happens must have a cause, um, and therefore everything backpropagating through time must have a cause, and you can try and argue that there must have been a first cause or that the universe lasted forever. These kinds of arguments Aristotle tried to formalize by writing down sentences in natural language in some kind of order, and they're trying to identify the principles that were being used there. Um, his main tool was what is called a syllogism, so you get these arguments like all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal, and that's a formal step of logical reasoning that's come from Aristotle. So ever since Aristotle, that view of logic was enshrined in the textbooks, and it was taught to generation after generation of students, um, all over the West at least, without really changing. People were just reading Aristotle's original work. And it was Boole who made the first real advance in this science for, for 2,000 years. This is really a much bigger step than some of the other heroes we've seen. When we saw the history of of Babbage's work, it's very clearly taking elements from a lot of other things that were going on at the time, you know, the punch card machines, the, the weaving looms, um, whereas Boole really just came out of nowhere with this. He just overthrew 2,000 years of, of logical thought. So he wrote a very famous book called The Laws of Thought. Um, I'd really recommend you at least look at this. It's quite a big book, so don't, don't read it all, but as your Lincoln students, be aware that a lot of this happened here. I've, I've put a link to it on the Blackboard system for you. Um, Boole is often kind of caricatured as only inventing this digital logic that we use in electronics design. That's not at all what his book was about. It's an amazing book. He was a philosopher, mathematician, what is now called a logician. So he, he invented the whole subject of modern logic. Um, there, there's now a field you can be a logician, which is kind of half mathematician, half philosopher, part computer scientist. It's still struggling to figure out exactly where it fits in the modern university. It's unusual to find a department of logic or a, a course in logic. It's normally going to sit within mathematics or philosophy or computing. Um, so what he actually does in his book, which is not, not usually spoken about or, or taught, he's developing this calculus of logic in order to do philosophy better. He's, he's trying to improve what Aristotle did. So you can take these very complex arguments for the existence of God. There's a whole chapter where he's trying to prove the existence of God. And he's writing down all these premises and the rules that he's using. And he turns them into algebra. And then he can do mathematics on that algebra and show whether the conclusion follows from the premises according to his rules of logic. Um, and he goes through a whole bunch of very famous traditional philosophical questions like this. What is the nature of evil, the nature of goodness? Do we have free will? And for the first time, there was this advance beyond Aristotle where you could really break an argument down into maybe hundreds of steps and show exactly how everything is getting derived from everything else. So his, his main motivation for this was to understand human reasoning. He was doing this as a model of how the human intellect works. So he was really the first modern cognitive scientist in, in his objectives. He was not so interested in mechanizing this. He was alive um, around the same time as Babbage and Lovelace, so they'd have been reading each other's work at this time. It was really people like Ada Lovelace who took these ideas and said, hey, you could mechanize this stuff with the machine that Babbage is doing over there, and then you'd create artificial intelligence. So 
maybe Bull was kind of the first cognitive scientist and Lovelace was the first artificial intelligence researcher. But of course, we all know Bool nowadays through these data types. Pretty much every language has a Boolean or a Bool data type, which is named after George Bool from here in Lincoln. And it, it's a data type that stores values that are true or false and must be either true or false. Okay. Now, in, in modern logics, we often have other truth values. When you, when you study modern logic in AI and computer science, you sometimes need logics where things can be neither true nor false, or some things can be both true and false. These can come up in weird mathematical scenarios, like if you're, if you're dealing with self-referential systems, there are statements like, this sentence is false, um, which in most logics will end up with one of these alternative truth values. They can also come up in artificial intelligence if you just don't know something. You know, is there a, a red elephant in the room next door to me? I just have no idea. I have no evidence about it, and I can't really make a, a judgment. So it has this kind of null, empty value rather than being true or false. But in Boolean logic, um, as defined by Boole, everything must be either true or false. And specifically, if it isn't true, you therefore know that it is false. That's not the case in some modern logic. So if you prove something isn't true, it's not necessarily false, because it could have one of these other stranger values. So Boolean, Boolean logic begins with some basic definitions defined in terms of their, their truth tables, their truth values. We've already assumed every variable is either true or false. So these, in Boole's work, these variables represented very interesting things. You know, X could be the fact that God exists, and Y could be the fact that the world is infinite, and all, all these kinds of interpretations that have been lost um, to, to later generations. So once you have these basic values, you can define um, logical operators. You say, if and only if X and Y are both true, then we say that X and Y is true. This symbol, you can read it as proves. So we're saying if the thing on the left is true, you can deduce or conclude the thing on the right, okay? So if X and Y are both true, that proves the statement that X and Y are true. And if this is not the case, then the thing on the right is false in Boolean logic, okay? Then we have the or statement. So they, these are intended to model human reasoning. Bull started with the way we use our brains, or our minds, um, to do logic, and he tried to turn them into mathematics. So a Boolean AND is supposed to be the kind of AND that you intuitively mean when you think of AND. When you think of OR, similar but different, OR means X or Y is true, if and only if X is true, or Y is true, or both of them are true, okay? And then we define not. So not just makes something the opposite. If x is false, then not x becomes true. From these basic definitions, and remember, these, these are basic because they've come from the way people think. They're the most basic elements of thought, according to Bohr. From those, we can derive um, additional um, operators. So we can make what's called x or exclusive or. So X exclusive or Y is true if and only if X is true and Y is false, or Y is true and X is false. But it's not true if they're both true. That's why it's called exclusive or. You've got to choose exclusively one or the other. But you can, you can create an exclusive or from a composition of the basic definitions. You don't have to postulate it as a new, a new axiom. So X or is true. You can say X or Y can be true, but also and not X and Y is true. Yeah? You've got to have one or the other, but not both. Then you can create these negated operators. So we can create a NOR operation. This is just the opposite of an OR. You do an OR and then you flip the result. So it's equivalent to not X or Y. Similarly, we can make a NAND. So AND gate becomes true if X and Y are true. A NAND gate only becomes true if X and Y are both false. And then there's this somewhat problematic operation called a, a conditional or impl implication, usually written as X arrow Y. Um, and this, 
this is not exactly a mistake by Bull, but it's it doesn't quite represent what he really wanted it to represent. It was supposed to represent this notion of causation or, or an ifness. It's supposed to represent if x is true, then y is true. Um, and Boole tried to capture this mental notion in Boolean logic by defining it according to this truth table. So if they're both true, or if x is false and y is true, or if they're both false, this thing can become true. Um, this has been problematic. It's a, a limitation of Boolean algebra that it actually doesn't encapsulate the notion of causality. Um, and it can lead you into big problems if you try and use this operator in the kind of philosophical arguments that, that Boole was interested in. It works as a, a logical statement, but the human interpretation of it doesn't quite match to what we think of as, as causality. To really understand causality, the, the work was done later, and you have to extend Boolean logic with this notion of possible worlds. You have to consider how the world could have been in all the cases that it wasn't, and X only causes Y if in every possible world Y comes on whenever X is on. But Boolean logic doesn't have that notion of possible worlds. It only deals with a single world. Okay, so... Bill's other great advance here was the idea of making a mapping, um, not quite a mathematical isomorphism, but, but almost a, a pure isomorphism between logic and arithmetic. You can already see we've started writing some of these logical operators as things that look like equations. We can define the XOR gate in terms of ors and ands and, and nots. And you can then do manipulation um, on these algebraic statements. But Bull took this further and he made a mapping from the notion of logical truth and falsehood to actual numbers, the integers 0 and 1. And if you make this mapping, you will find the AND operation looks very much like multiplication in numerical algebra. Um, the OR operation looks kind of like an addition, and the NOT operation looks like doing 1, one minus x, okay, in, inverting. It's not quite a pure mapping. You'll find cases where you have to have 1 plus 1 equals 1 or 1 plus 1 equals 0. Um, it doesn't quite fit to arithmetic, but it, it almost does. And it's close enough for you to use what you know about numerical arithmetic and apply the same kinds of rules to do your logical reasoning. So we kind of take this for granted now. There are some quite sloppy programming languages in existence today, um, specifically in the C family, where you can play quite fast and loose between real Boolean true and false values and integers 0 and 1. Okay, if you've ever seen a program with a, a line like if 0 or if 1, which are used just as true and false to turn on and off a chunk of code, this is actually quite a sloppy thing to do. You're, you're not really treating the type system the way it, it should be done. But it's because of Boole that we do that so intuitively now. And until Boole, logic was an art subject. It was done in natural language by philosophy types. It was one of the, the, the very classical subjects of study. You could do, what is it, logic, rhetoric, and theology, or music, or something, was the, the classical education. And when Boole came along, he makes this mapping to arithmetic, which is this completely other thing that happens over in the, the STEM departments along with physics and geometry. This chunk of philosophy and this chunk of mathematics from two different buildings is suddenly merged together. And we see that in our code now. Whenever you play fast and loose in C with zeros and ones and true and false, you're, you're making use of this gigantic result that Boole found, that, that you could do that. So, in modern computers, the, the use of this then is that we can now map binary arithmetic down to logic as well. It means we can build, say, an arithmetic logic unit for doing integer addition out of these very simple logical gates. And we can use all the machinery of logical inference that Boole developed for these philosophical arguments, we can use it to do something different now. We can use it to simplify the designs of our chips and our, our circuits that do this. If we go off in other 
directions away from computer science, we'll see this, this discovery of Boole also leads to everything in, in modern logic. This was the creation of logic as a field. Maybe later on we'll talk about logicians like Frege and Gödel, who came later, um, leading up to Turing's work on computable numbers. They, they all build on Boole's work in a, a more mathematical direction. But we're going to take it in the direction of computer science and architecture. OK. Um, just some examples of Boolean theorems. I'm not going to go through these derivations, but it's something you should learn about. The best way to learn Boolean algebra is to do it. You all have some nice textbooks with a chapter on Boolean algebra in them. Just try and sit down and try and prove some theorems using Boolean algebra. You have the basic definitions um, from, from the previous slide. But you'll be able to, to illustrate some of these classic proofs. There are, there are several laws, like the identity law, the commutative law, or associative law. And they just show, they show properties of, of Boolean algebra. This is quite a mathematical process, but they also have applications when we're doing chip design. We'll see that you can use these rules to make your chip design simpler and make it use fewer logic gates and fewer transistors. There are two basic approaches to doing these kinds of proofs, and this becomes the foundation of a whole load of computer science going through the next century and up to the present day. One way to do your proofs, and this is important in your workshops and in your exams, one way to do your proofs is to use the theorems as sentences, as statements. You can reason using the laws. You know, you know if x, then y, and if y, then z, and you can conclude, therefore, if x, than Z, and you're working with the symbols, the terms in the equations themselves. The other way to do this is what is called model checking or a brute force approach. If you go back to the truth tables, you can take a complex equation like this, A, a plus B, C. You can write out the entire truth table for it. You can say, what is every possible combination that A, B, and C can take? That will give you two to the three or eight possibilities. And you can look at exactly what they all evaluate to. And if you want to claim, say, that A plus B, C is equal to A plus B times A plus C, you can compute the truth table for both sides and say, are they the same? Okay. So what you see here is the genesis of two very different schools of thought in formalized mathematics. One is that you, you turn the handle. Remember the handle from, from Babbage's machine? Yeah, that's where it comes from. One is you turn the handle and you just compute everything. You brute force model check what's going on. And the other is that you're working with the mathematics and, and the terms themselves. Okay, and that's, that's going to lead you much later on to two, two different schools of computer science and automated theorem proving and AI. So here's an example of using the, the law-based method. Okay, here's what we're trying to prove. AB plus not AC plus PC equals AB plus not AC. Here we're, we're starting with the left-hand side and at each line we're going to replace what it's equal to with some other terms using one of the laws. Okay, and here we're, we're naming the law we've invoked on the right-hand side. If you have already proved a bunch of laws, especially these basic identities that show up in many Boolean algebra problems, you can invoke those laws. You don't have to go right back to the original definitions. You can invoke the distributive law or the associative law. But at each step, we're, we're invoking a law, saying which one it is, making a substitution until we've converted the thing on the left into the thing on the right. Okay? If you don't want to work like this, the alternative is you just write down a list of every possible value that A, B, C can have on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and you can do model checking. You can just brute force the thing and show that the two things are equal. Okay, so that, that was bull. Um, really interested in philosophy and modeling human cognition, not so much in the mechanical side. Um, Claude Shannon, who lived later, was interested in the mechanical side, and he took Boole's theory um, spectacularly in his MSc thesis, and he invented the idea of a logic gate. He realized there was a one-to-one -one mapping between the terms in Boole's algebra, which was originally this philosophical thing, and he realized you could map it onto the functioning of these electronic gates, which work with high and low voltages, representing truth and falsehood, or zero or one. Um, 
This is, without question, the greatest master's thesis of all time. I've given you a copy on, on Blackboard. Um, just, some of you guys are going to stick around and do an MSc af after your, your undergrad degree, right? It, imagine doing this in three, three years' time from now and just revolutionizing the whole of computer science in your master's thesis when you're like 21 years old. Um, amazing. After that, he also went on to invent communication theory. So he did two spectacular things in the same lifetime. Amazing guy. So Shannon was involved in telecommunications. At the time, there were lots of problems about switching of, of cables. Um, initially, there were human operators. You'd call the operator and say, I want to speak to John Smith at 21 Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, and the operator would take two bits of wire and they'd physically connect you to the person you were calling. And there was a time when all this was becoming mechanized. So this is before we got the valves and the transistors. This is in the time of uh, electromechanical systems, um, relay-based systems. But Shannon was interested in how to simplify some of the, the circuits. It was leading to very big, complex circuit designs, which were both error-prone and costly. And they needed a way to show that two circuits were equivalent to each other. And if you could show a complex circuit is equivalent to a simple circuit, you can replace it with a simple one, and you, you save your company a lot of money, you make it more reliable, less error prone, and so on. So Shannon was playing around with these ideas, and he came up with the idea of the logic gate. In particular, he found there were certain sets of logic gates that together could represent anything. Um, so the NAND and NOR operations that he took from Bull's work uh, are what is called universal. You can make any machine you like out of just a collection of NAND and NORs. And when you've done that, you can then apply Bull's algebra. You can go through those equations, simplify them, and you can take your complex circuit made out of those gates, and you can make it into a much smaller, cheaper, and more reliable circuit. You can build any, any computer from this. You can build a, a church computable device, which in turn can simulate anything. So the concept of a logic gate in general, it's just a device which takes some Boolean inputs and creates some Boolean outputs as a, a function of them. Um, currently, we use electricity to do this. We typically take two voltages, um, which might be 0 and 5, or sometimes 0 and 3.3 .3 volts um, in a lot of our chips. And we use those voltages, high and low, to represent 0 and 1, or true and false. And we can define different types of gates which do different operations and we'll, we'll write them with a different symbol. Okay, so the basic gates coming from Boole's theory, these are not the most basic in terms of implementation, they're the most basic in terms of how we think. These are what Boole originally modeled as the laws of thought. You can do and, okay, two inputs, if they're both one, the output becomes one. You can do or. If either one of them is one, the output is one. And you can do not, which flips the input. And notice here we've got numbers now. When Boole did this, he was thinking about truthhood and falsehood. And then he found this mapping from true and false to numbers. And now we have this new mapping by Shannon from the numbers into electrical voltages that actually implement them. So we can also define the XOR gate. So remember, in Boole's theory, this is a, a derived notion. It's not a basic way of thinking. Um, in terms of logic gates, you could implement it as a basic thing, or you could build it out of those other gates if you prefer. That would be a very simple example of this simplification process, right? If you took the original Boolean expression for XOR, which is made out of several ands and ors and a not, whatever, you could take all those gates and you could replace them with a single XOR gate if you have a nice way of building XOR gates. So the, the XOR gate is written it's like an OR gate, except it has a, a little bar on the end there. Uh, I always forget which of these gates is which, even now. <laughs> and I, I think of the AND gate as looking like the letter D. Okay, the word AND has a D, and the gate looks just like the D from AND. And OR doesn't, maybe you can kind of think of it as looking a bit more like the letter R somehow, the top part of the letter R. The NOT gate has a, a bubble on the end showing inversion. That bubble appears in some other places as well. It's a general symbol for inversion. 
fact they appear right here when we create these NAND and NOR gates. Again, these are derived notions in Bohr, but they are more fundamental in Shannon. So a NAND gate is conceptually is an AND gate with a negation stuck on the end of it. So it's written as a, a big D from the word AND with a negation. And the NOR gate is like a, the top part of a letter R with a negation. Okay. So NAND and NOR in Boole's theory are somewhat obscure operations. They don't really capture the way people think on a day-to-day -day psychological basis. But they become fundamental in Shannon's theory because they have this special property that they can be used to build any function. You can take any great big Boolean expression and you can find a way to build that only out of NAND and, and NOR gates. This is not the case with Boolean AND and OR gates. Um, for example, you couldn't build a NOT gate just using AND and OR. You'd need to have at least three gates, AND or NOT. So NAND and NOR have this nice property that you've only got to be able to make two things instead of three or more things. Um, and for this reason, they're the most common building blocks in the chips we build today. Okay. So far, we've talked about logical operations just with two inputs and one output, you know, anding two bits together, boring two bits together. You will also see these operations used to describe um, effects on whole arrays um, of binary numbers or, or, or words of numbers. In a language like C, you'll see, th these are the famous bit twiddling operators of C. There's always controversy around whether it's a good thing to let programmers loose with these because they can be used to do all, all kinds of bad things. Um, usually bad for the next programmer who has to read their source codes rather than for the, the, the actual users. So you can do operations like oring two words together. So here we're not dealing with individual bits anymore. In this case we've got 8-bit uh, words or bytes. We've got a, a byte of x and a byte of y and we're going to or the whole thing together to get an output. The effect of this is that each bit is getting ORed together. So 1 and 0 is 1, 1 and 1 is 1, 1 and 0 is 1, and so far. Okay? So this is a related notion to a gate, but it's an extended notion, because you're applying that gate's operation to a whole bunch of bits that are stacked together. When you look at these, you might notice some resemblance to some of the binary arithmetic concepts we talked about last week. Remember, these are purely logical operations, okay? Remember, Boole's great contribution was to find this link between logic and arithmetic, and last week we talked about arithmetic. Here we're, we're at least starting by talking about logic, but if you look at this effect of oring, does, does anyone notice a, a resemblance of this to anything? Okay, or take, actually, let's, let's take the XOR. Okay? So this, this looks a little bit like the process of addition that we had last week. Okay, we've got one, one and zero gives a one. One and one gives a zero because in addition you want to carry, yeah? That, that will create a 10 and the one's going to get carried to the next column. So there's no carrying here, but it gives you part of that process. And zero and zero also give you zero. So XOR looks a little bit like that part of the addition. The AND operator looks like the other half. It looks like the carrying process. Yeah? So 1 and 0 is 0, there's no carry. That's not the right answer for the addition, but it's the right answer for the carry. If you have 1 and 1, then you do carry. That's telling you you could get a carry. So there's a bit of a clue here. Ne neither, neither the XOR or the AND operator by themselves performs addition, but you can see they look like parts of the, the addition algorithm. Okay, and we're, we're going to make use of that later on. But for now, I want to go down the hardware stack um, a little more, right, right to the bottom, and show you how we actually build these gates. Um, when I was a student, I got really confused about logic gates, because I thought they were the basic building blocks of computers. And when you look down a microscope at a chip, uh, I was expecting to see lots of little AND and OR and NOT gates, and there weren't any. There were just these things called transistors. So you have to understand, at the physical level, AND and OR and NAND gates don't actually exist. All that exists on the chip is a bunch of transistors. But the transistors are grouped together to make NAND gates and NOR gates. Okay? Um, 
And it's that grouping that becomes the, the base. Maybe if you're really experienced, if you work in chip design, you probably can look down a microscope and see the patterns. You can probably see a bunch of transistors laid out in a characteristic pattern that forms these different types of gates. But it's not, it's not completely obvious. So we have to construct those gates out of transistors, okay? Now we've looked at transistors a little bit before. Remember, a transistor is basically an electrical switch. It has two inputs and an output. One of those inputs is a switch. If the switch is off, nothing goes, goes through. If the switch is on, then the current can flow from the input to the output. So this is the symbol for a transistor. This is a high voltage. Um, this is a zero, a ground voltage. And these are two inputs, which can either be high or low. So it's very easy to build these negated and 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 NOR gates from transistors. It's easier than building the, the AND and OR gates. Um, you can make a NAND by putting these two transistors um, in series. And so the output, if these transistors are off, the output is connected to the high voltage, and you get a 1 coming out has to go through a res resistor, which is hard work. Um, if both of these transistors are turned on, only if they're both on, then the current can flow to ground. You make the connection to ground, and the output will drop down to zero volts. <coughs> so only if both transistors are on do you get a zero coming out, and that's the definition of NAND. So NOR is similar, but we use a different circuit topology, um, because now we want the output to be a zero if either of these guys are on, okay? So you see now we've got two grounds, and if either of these transistors are turned on, the output will be connected directly to one of the grounds, and that's the logic we need to create a NOR gate, okay? There are other ways to make gates out of transistors as well. These, the ones here are maybe not used so much in reality, but they're the easiest ones to understand, they're the easiest ones to, to study. But it's the same kind of idea you'd get in the other implementation. Just to remind, uh, you don't need to use electricity to build gates. Sh Shannon's theory was developed for electromechanical relays, which are some, somewhat like modern transistors. But his theory is just as applicable to all these other kinds of computer we've talked about. We talked about making computers out of water and this billiard ball example. So remember, here's a way we can make an AND gate out of billiard balls. We make a physical chamber with some poles for the inputs and the outputs. And we set it up so that firing a ball represents a one, not firing a ball represents a zero. We set it up so that if we were to fire two balls in at once, they'll collide in a certain way and bounce around, and they'll, one of them will come out of the, the AND output. And if you only fire one ball in, it'll pass straight through. If you only fire one ball there, it'll go straight through and come out there. If you only fire one there, it'll come out there. So only if they hit each other, they'll bounce off and, and come out that way. Again, this sometimes gets lost in the discussion of chip design because everyone is using electronics right now. But when we get to, say, quantum computing, this becomes very important because people are trying to create these gates from very different kinds of material. The billiard ball gate is a, actually a somewhat extended version of the AND gate because it has this reversible property. You can see there's actually two outputs. We talked about energy before. You have to put two physical balls going in there, and those balls are carrying kinetic energy. That energy has to go somewhere. And in a current transistor-based system, we're losing energy because there's only one output and there's two inputs. And that's why our computers are getting hot, because we're throwing that other energy away. With these kinds of systems, and with, with the quantum systems that, that are based upon them, you can keep track of that energy coming out the other way, and potentially reduce the amount of heat you have to give off as, as waste if you keep track of that energy. But back to electronics then. Um, we'll talk about how these chips are made in a moment, but when you actually see logic gates when you touch them with your hands. This is the most basic form um, you will currently buy them in. If you go on eBay or your favorite website, you can buy simple logic chips for about two pounds each. Um, these are still occasionally used 
in the real world. These are very basic chips. They just contain a, a few transistors, tens of transistors. Um, and they are packaged to implement a bunch of logic gates. So the famous series of chips is called the 7400 series. Originally made by Texas Instruments, now they're made by all kinds of people. Uh, it's a generic series of them. They all start with the same numbers and they have different numbers at the end which tell you what's inside. So you can get a chip, for example, with four NOR gates sitting on it. So these are the pins of the chip, yeah? We've got 14 pins, some are inputs, some are outputs, and you've got four logic gates sitting in there. Or you can get one with a bunch of NOT gates, or you can get one with a bunch of NAND gates. You could build a whole computer out of these chips. You'd need quite a lot of them. Um, it has been done. You need to locate every gate in your circuit, and you're going to put a wire there. This is a, called a breadboard. It's a piece of plastic with electrical connectors in it that make the wiring easier. You can just make your circuit to connect up all the inputs and the outputs of the gates. You've just got to remember which bit of silicon which gate is sitting on. They tend to show up nowadays in kind of simple gluing things together applications. So we put one of these in a, a robot the other day. We're, we have a small self-driving car project here, and that car has a safety system. Um, and when you build a safety system, you actually build several safety systems, because if one of them goes down, you need the others to, to be there as well. So a safety system has a bunch of things that all have to be on at the same time in order for the vehicle to move. If any of these things goes off, then we're going to cut the power. Um, and we have one of these chips in there, and it's got an AND gate. <laughs> you have a, an AND from each of these safety things. There's like a button that you hold in your hand, and if anyone lets go of that button, all the power's going to go down. But all these things are getting ANDed together in a chip like that, and it's only if they're all turned on that you can flow through. So it's unlikely you'd build a whole computer now. You're more likely to see these popping up in things like robotics applications nowadays. Let's go right down to the transistor level now and try and get some understanding of how a transistor actually works. Um, so this is the domain of semiconductor physics. We're not going to get into the details of this. You need quantum mechanics to really understand it, but I'll give you a kind of cartoon overview of semiconductor physics. A semiconductor is something which nearly conducts, right? A conductor conducts electricity. A semiconductor nearly does. If you just prod it a little bit, you can encourage it to conduct. It's right on the, the boundary of conducting or not conducting. That's why it's called a semiconductor. That's the property we're going to use for doing computation, because we want to control whether things are conducting or not to make transistors. It all comes down to this very fundamental idea of one-way physics. When we do computing, when we write our programs, we want to change the world in a certain way. We're in a state, and we want to do things that take that state to another state. This is a very different concept from what normally happens in physics, because the laws of physics are reversible. You can take Newton's theory of motion and flip time and make it go backwards, and the laws are exactly the same. You kick a ball and it goes this way, but if you were to unkick it, unkick it at the other end, it would go back the other way. And there's a sense, if you try and build any physical system, there's often just as much probability as going from A to B as there is of going from B to A, which is difficult if you want to do compute, computation, because the whole point of computation is you've started in A and you really want to get to B and stay in B. So this idea of creating a physical process that only runs in one direction through time is very fundamental to what computation is. And it's, it can seem quite paradoxical if you come at this from the, the physical viewpoint. Let's consider a very simple one-way system. Okay, this, this is a piece of plumbing. This is for water to flow through. It's a little trapdoor. It's called a valve. Okay? Um, you probably have a bunch of these in your house, in your, your radiator system. So here we have a trapdoor on a spring, and we have a little block down here, and if the water tries to flow this direction, it will push against the trapdoor, and it will get stuck on the block, and no water can flow through the system. If the water approaches from this direction, it will push on the other side of the trapdoor, which is not blocked by the block, and the water can flow through. Okay? If you're coming from physics, statistical physics background, this is 
very worrying because all of your physics equations should say that you could start in the finished state and run Newton's laws backwards and end up where you started again. So why, why doesn't the water in, in this valve flow backwards? Because the, the system should be symmetric. It should look just like the, the first case with the water flowing the other way. So any, any ideas what's going on here? Okay. So there's, there's a clue if you consider what happens to the trapdoor afterwards. Okay, it's a little bit of a trick question. You can think of the water pushing the door and flowing through, and you might think that's the end of the story. You have to consider what happens after the water has flown through. And what happens when it closes? Yeah, it bounces. So as it's closing, it has energy, it's moving. Okay? If it kept its energy, it would bounce off it, and it would keep bouncing forever, and the water could flow both ways. But what actually happens is that energy is lost as heat, okay? This is the same idea we've seen in the, the electronics cases about why your CPU gets hot. This system has the property that if you go through it one way, you waste some of your energy. You take water, energy out of the water that's coming in, you put it in the trapdoor, and then it's going to bounce, and it's going to give off heat. And there's a very famous law of physics called the second law of thermodynamics, which says you can never get heat back again because the statistics of it is that when it's lost, you forget where the energy is and you, you can't bring it back, um, except in really special scenarios. So fundamentally, there's this connection between one-wayness and the use of energy. You also find this concept in biology. The, Fundamental mechanisms of life are all to do with energy transfer. Most of our, our cells are based on simple machines that take a molecule called ATP, which contains energy, and they have exactly this kind of mechanism. You put in the energy, not, not to get motion, but to get directionality, to make a one-way process occur. If you have a cell that's trying to pump some chemical from here to here, like you get in a, a neuron cell, you power that directionality. You power the pump by putting in this energy. The energy isn't destroyed. Energy can never be destroyed. It's always conserved. When people talk about the world is running out of energy, they're not quite using the right word. What, what they mean is the world is running out of energy that we know where it is. If you take some energy and you use it, the energy is still there, but it's lost. We've lost the information about where the energy is. So there's this deep connection between directionality and energy use. This is at the very core of building a computer. This is why you need energy to make your computer go, because you're trying to make it go in a certain direction to, to run a program from the beginning to the end. OK, so we would like to build an equivalent of that water valve um, nowadays from very small electronics that we can put on the chip. So we're going to start with this concept of a semiconductor then. So we know chips are made of silicon. You're going to go to the beach, you're going to get some sand, you're going to purify it, and you're going to make a, a nice wafer of, of silicon to build all this. So why are chips made of silicon? OK, there's, there's a couple of elements that you could do this with, but they'd be more expensive, um, more difficult to work with. The basic property of silicon is that it's element 14 in the periodic table, which means it has electrons in, has two, eight, and four electrons. And the outside shell has four, which means it's half full. That's the reason we use silicon or silicon like elements. Um, so this is the same property as carbon, which is used as the basis of life. So there's actually a close relationship between carbon and life and biology and computers and silicon. They're both using these, these same kinds of ideas. We can make a crystal structure from silicon because how many people here have done, done chemistry recently? OK, a few. Let's do, do some basic chemistry, really basic chemistry. So atoms have multiple shells. You only care about the one on the outside, and they like to be full. Okay, um, in the case of all the atoms here, they like to have eight electrons in the outer shell. They're happy if they've got eight. Where happy means are in a low energy state. There's a mathematical definition of happiness. So they will generally act in ways that try to get eight electrons into each shell. That can include sharing electrons. So when you arrange silicon like this, the, the electrons team up so that everyone's happy because they've got eight. Okay. Um, 
So this is not a conducting material because all the electrons are sitting there and they're happy. If you were to take one extra electron and chuck it in there, it would conduct very nicely because everywhere else is happy and the extra electron can wander around um, in a, a fairly random way or in the direction of a current if you choose to put one over it. So we can create this kind of state by a process called doping. If we take some silicon and insert some extra atoms, just a few, only a few, but in this grid, we're going to take just a few atoms that have 15 electrons instead of 14, and we're just going to chuck them in there, mix them with the silicon. And in this one, we're going to take some that have 13 electrons. Okay, they're missing one. So there are some unhappy atoms here. These are unhappy because they've got an extra electron that they'd like to get rid of. These are unhappy because they're missing one that they'd like to have. Okay, but they are electrically neutral. So this creates a balance of forces. What, what this will result in is some of the electrons from over here crossing over to the other side. This only happens when we bring them together and it only happens at the, the boundary between the two. So some of those extra electrons, like this guy was sitting here, will cross over there. This makes this, this atom very happy because it's got a full complement of eight electrons now. And it makes these atoms happy because they've got eight. There's a price for that though, which is you've unbalanced the electrical forces. Okay, this happiness is what's called a chemical force. It's a, a chemical energy um, that is being made happy. But that's competing with an opposite electrical force. So, in a sense, these electrons are not happy because there's more negative charge here than there is um, positive charge and the opposite on the other side. And those two forces balance each other out. You don't get all the electrons here crossing over. That would make everywhere very happy, but it would really unbalance the electrical forces and make that very unhappy. So you get a balance where some of them cross, but only the ones that are near the boundary. So you get a few of these, um, a few of the electrons have gone over here, which gives you a positive charge on that side and a negative charge on the other side. Okay? This is quite a hard concept to, to really understand. The, the physics are more complicated than this, but fundamentally it's a chemical force versus a electrical force. And it gives rise to a voltage. It means if you were to, to measure the voltage across that surface, it would be zero here, then there'd be a positive region followed by a negative region followed by zero. Okay? This gives you the equivalent of that trap door in the water valve. Okay? If I take an electron, which has a negative charge, and I throw it at the system from the right. It's going to approach the system like this, and as it gets closer to the negative region, it will be repelled, because negative charges repel each other. Okay? So I can take an electron with a certain velocity, I'll throw it here, it will gradually slow down, it will get more and more repelled, and it will bounce off, and it will go home again. Okay? So my electron can't get through the barrier from this side. But if I take the same electron, going at the same speed, but I throw it from the other side, something different happens because now there's a positive charge in front of it. That positive charge will attract it and it will accelerate the electron towards it. And as the electron hits this region, it's now going fast enough, it's got enough energy that it can get over the, the barrier of the negative side and get through. So we've built an electrical version of the, the plumbing system. Okay, it's a valve, an electrical valve. So this isn't yet a switch. We, we don't have a transistor, but this is called a diode. Okay? Um, some of these things will give off a colour of light as they run. They're called light-emitting diodes or LEDs, and we put them in our electronic devices when we want to visualise things. We can make a transistor by shoving two of these things together. If we take two diodes and stack them in sequence, so now we have two potential barriers like this. They're set up so that the barriers are facing in opposite directions. That means nothing can flow in either direction because this half is blocking a flow in one direction, this half is blocking a flow in the other direction. So in its natural state, the transistor will sit there and nothing can flow in either way. But then we introduce a third force, which is this electrical switch. Okay? So here we have injected some current into the center portion of it. Okay? We're going to inject electrons, if you like, um, or positive current, if you prefer, we're going to inject that into here, and that's going to unbalance the two barriers, okay? 
So if we were to inject an extra electron here, that would push these electrons away, the ones that are sitting at the boundaries, and it'll tip the balance. Remember, we have these two forces in a very fine balance, the chemical force and the, the electrical force. It will shove them out of balance, and that process will allow a current to flow um, through the whole transistor. Okay? So this, this is how we make the equivalent of the, the plumbing switch. Now, you put a current going in, it's effectively going to open two water trapdoors in both directions, and that will let the main current flow through there. Okay? This is all very much a cartoon. To really understand it, you have to get into quantum mechanics, and we're, we're not going to go there. Um, if you want to go there, I'd really recommend uh, the Britney Spears Guide to Semiconductor Physics, which is actually really good. Okay. So, how does this all work in practice? We know how to make a transistor now. We know we need silicon, and we know we need to put in these two kinds of dopants. We need to put in these two other elements that have different numbers of electrons. We need to get them in the right places, and then we need bits of copper wire to connect the transistors to each other. Okay? So your silicon is going to sit there and not do anything. Um, doesn't conduct by itself. Where we form the transistors and connect them with wire, that's where the, the circuits are going to flow. The process of making them is almost exactly like making t-shirts. So when I was a kid, mm -hmm. I used to do t-shirt design for Goa Trans bands. My claim to fame is I once made a t-shirt for Juno, Juno Reactor, who later featured on the Matrix soundtrack. So I'm like five degrees of separation from Keanu Reeves or something. So this is, this is exactly what we used to do in the t-shirt factory. Um, you would start by making your design on a computer and you'd print it out on a transparency. You don't see this so much nowadays. Before they had PowerPoint, you used to print all your slides out on these transparencies and put them on a projector. It's exa exactly the same transparency. Then you take um, a piece of cloth, which was traditionally silk, nowadays it's probably synthetic, and you cover it in this chemical called a photoresist mask. This chemical has a property that if you hit it with light, something's going to happen. So then you, you wait for that to dry, you put your transparency on top of it, and then you shine a bright light on it, often UV light. Um, and in this case, that's going to fix all of the mask everywhere the light lands. The, the light makes a reaction occur, so all of this part of the mask doesn't allow ink to penetrate it anymore but the part that you covered up doesn't receive any light, and that's still going to be soluble, so you can wash that away. You pour water on it, and the, the chemical runs out, and it leaves, it leaves a hole in your screen where you want the ink to go through. So then you pile on a load of ink, and in those days it was all manual, shove it with a squeegee, and that creates one color on your T-shirt. Okay? Um, and then you repeat this several times to put all the different colors on. We used to do this with highly um, phosphorescent colors. So when, when the UV light came on in the Goa Trans Club, you could glow in the dark in six different colors. Um, this is exactly the same process that is used to make a chip. We have this wafer of silicon, just like a t-shirt, and we're going to create a bunch of these masks. And each mask is going to be used for putting a different kind of stuff on the chip these different elements we've seen, the copper wires, the, the doping agents. It's a little more complex than that because you can, you can also destroy things, so you can use some masks that add layers like colors of t-shirt, but imagine we, we also had special dyes for the t-shirt that could dissolve certain colors. If you had a mask that could make all the, the red ink disappear or the green ink disappear. So you can use a combination of additive processes and subtractive processes. Nowadays, we'd call this 3D printing. Okay? Um, in chip design, it's called photolithography. Um, it's kind of easier to understand now. Everyone's used to what a 3D printer is. So remember, we've got to put the wires on, and we've got to make the transistors. So typically, you're going to have this base of silicon. We're going to make the transistors by throwing stuff on the silicon. And then we're going to make the wires connecting them together. Nowadays, these circuits can get fairly three-dimensional. You can have wires crossing over each other through this, this layering process. Um, it's not quite as simple as making t-shirts. You can make t-shirts for a, a few hundred pounds. Um, to build one of these will cost you about five billion pounds to set up your, your fab plant. 
and then it'll cost you £5 million to make the set of masks. Um, nowadays, there might be 300 different masks, which each represents a, a chemical process taking place. So you have to be very careful in chip design to get your design right, because you really don't want to leave a bug in there and spend £5 million on the masks and then find out your chip doesn't work. This is why chip designers are very interested in mathematical proofs now that their, their chips actually work before it's too late. So we'll have a little break. I'm just going to show you an illustration of that, that chip making process. This comes from... <laughs> 